Good evening, I'm Dennis Richmond. Elaine Corral is off tonight. A profile is emerging tonight of the man police say carried out the worst massacre in San Francisco history. 55-year-old Jean Luigi Ferry is described by friends as a frustrated businessman. Some say he was a hothead, others called him a melancholy loner. Yesterday, just before 3 p.m., police say Ferry calmly stepped off an elevator on the 34th floor of 101 California Street and began killing people. We have a series of reports tonight. We begin our coverage with a live report from Diane Dwyer at the scene of the shooting in San Francisco. Diane. Dennis, the streets here near 101 California are calm tonight. The only signs of last night's deadly chaos are some bouquets of flowers and memories of those who died. There are still many unanswered questions about the suspect, 55-year-old Jean Ferry. He had been involved in the real estate and mortgage business for years, but people who knew him said he had serious financial problems. Complaints was that uh, he couldn't get any clients, he couldn't do any business at all. The problem was he didn't know the business. It had nothing to do with the business, he just didn't know what he's doing. His business failing, Ferry came here to 101 California yesterday afternoon and opened fire on people in the offices of the Pettit and Martin law firm. He had hired Pettit and Martin 11 years ago to represent him in a real estate deal that had gone bad. He reportedly lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in the deal, and he apparently blamed the attorneys here. Cops are looking for him on the 33rd, 34th, and 32nd floor. Ferry was born in Ethiopia, but lived in the Bay Area in the 70s and 80s. In 1977, he and his wife, Donna Benedetti, filed for divorce in Alameda County. The court documents do not say why they divorced or if they had any children. A year later, he worked in this building on Battery Street in downtown San Francisco for Marcus and Millichap, a real estate company. We talked to the man who hired him, Bill Clarkson, by phone today. Very quiet, uh, professional in appearance. A very uh, positive uh, appearing uh, individual, the kind who uh, would command uh, a presence, and uh, he was uh, very articulate. A nice guy, Clarkson says, but a poor salesman. He fired him just six months later. In the early 1980s, Ferry lived in Larkspur at the Skylark apartment complex. He was an active member of the San Rafael Rotary Club and was known as a happy but quiet man. But his business problems continued. In 1982, Ferry got involved in a deal with an Indianapolis mobile home park. It was that deal that ended with litigation involving Pettit and Martin. In 1983, he tried to build a hotel in Pleasanton. It was never built. By 1989, Ferry had moved to Southern California. For the past year, he lived alone in an apartment complex in Woodland Hills. The building manager says he was behind in his rent. His latest business venture was in this mini mall, and business at ADF Mortgage was not good. According to people who work nearby, his financial problems had worsened of late. They described him as nervous and agitated. He would go in and out of his office all the time. He would be in there for half an hour, an hour, and then he'd come out, go down to his car, sit in his car, come back, go to the bathroom. Now, the 10 o'clock news has also learned from the San Francisco coroner's office that Ferry's body had signs of sadomasochistic trauma. Also, we have learned that Ferry had some tax problems as well. The state tax board filed a lien against him for non-payment of taxes. And in 1988, he was apparently involved in a lawsuit in Marin County that was also involved real estate. Learning more and more about him as we go along, Dennis. Diane, thank you for that report. Before he killed himself, Jean-Luigi Ferre killed eight people. He apparently knew none of them. Police say he said nothing to them, that he simply began shooting. The people who died were victims of circumstance. They just happened to be there when Ferry got out the elevator on the 34th floor of that building at 3 o'clock yesterday. Tonight, we know who those victims are. Kerry Manley is in San Francisco with a live report. Kerry. Dennis, the coroner in San Francisco now says all eight victims died at virtually point-blank range, and then the gunman shot himself. Now, uh, earlier tonight, we did have a chance to talk to some of the survivors of this shooting, and obviously for them, this is a time of intense grief. Went to work with them yesterday morning. It seems like three years ago already. It was yesterday morning. Mike Cooper lives on this tree-lined street in Berkeley. Yesterday, as usual, he drove to work with his friend and neighbor, Alan Burke, both men partners at the Pettit and Martin Law Firm in San Francisco. But last night, Alan never came home gunned down on the 34th floor. Michael Cooper was on the 35th floor. And the receptionist at the desk across from this conference room ran in It said, someone is shooting and killing people on the 34th floor, you have to get out. 
and it took a few seconds to, to register. That, that, that doesn't make sense. Uh, we left the office and we went through the corridor, through the, through the, past the elevators to a stairwell. No one really knew what to do. The 34th, 34th floor is below us, so you're not sure what to do. One of my uh, partners uh, went down the stairwell to see if it was all right to go down the stairwell and was confronted apparently by this assailant, came back up the stairwell and told us to move out of the area and we then took the elevator down. Now Michael says he has feelings of guilt that he survived and his friend did not, a friend for the past 18 years. Alan was a, just a wonderful man, a wonderful husband, great father, uh, great sense of humor, uh, an eclectic, uh, great many interests, all the way from the warriors to opera to symphony to plays, very busy life, a, a do-gooder, get-the-job-done kind of guy, excellent at his profession. Well, Another colleague, 28-year-old John Scully, also died. When confronted on the 33rd floor by the gunman, he reportedly jumped in front of his wife, Michelle, to save her life. She did survive and remains hospitalized. Scully's colleagues say he indeed was someone special. There's no question that John was a well-liked attorney. The words were uh, probably one of the nicest young men. Uh, wonderful disposition. Another victim, David Sutcliffe, a law student from Colorado doing a summer clerkship at Pettit and Martin. Uh, people here hold David in very high regard and uh, have a lot of affection for him. The good guy young, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to understand. The other victims include 30-year-old Jody Spasato, a wife and mother of a 10-month-old baby girl from Lafayette who happened to be at the law firm for a deposition. Also dead, executive legal assistant Shirley Mooser of San Francisco, 64 years old. Attorney Jack Berman, 35 years old, from San Francisco. And 48-year-old Donald Michael Merrill of Oakland. For the survivors, thoughts tonight are with the victims and their loved ones. But as for the man who pulled the trigger... He was a sick individual. Uh, I haven't given him much thought. I mean, it's a random killing. I'm not so... It's not him that bothers me so much and angers me so much. It's the... It's the idea of guns that bothers me a great deal because sick individuals like that can't do very much without those weapons. Five people remain hospitalized tonight, in, including two in critical condition. Now, as for Michelle Scully, she has been told that her husband did not survive. According to a new su nursing supervisor tonight at San Francisco General, she was well enough to be able to be released from the hospital earlier this evening, well enough to go home. Dennis? Carrie, thank you. The police say Ferry arrived at 101 California Street with his three powerful weapons and hundreds of rounds of ammunition concealed on him and in an oversized attache case. John Fowler looks at Ferry's arsenal and recounts step by step what took place just prior to and during that deadly rampage. At a press conference, police showed the gunman's deadly arsenal, what they called his weapons of war. Two 9mm machine pistols modified for extra rapid fire, each with 50 round clips and a seven-shot Colt 45. They say the gunman also had a large cache of ammunition that John Luigi Ferry fired 50 to 100 rounds from these guns. Police say Ferry parked his late 80s Cadillac at Embarcadero 2 in downtown San Francisco yesterday and dressed inconspicuously in a suit and tie, walked the two blocks to 101 California, trailing his arsenal behind him in a lawyer-style briefcase on a dolly, as lawyers commonly do. He took it in the elevator, and when he arrived at the 34th floor, he shed his coat and began to prepare for battle. He has a semi-automatic uh, weapon mounted on each shoulder with shoulder straps. Uh, we find at a later time to each gun is attached a 50-round clip, and he walks in without a word and started shooting. The oval-shaped 34th floor of 101 California is Pettit and Martin Law Offices. The gunman got off the elevator here and walked directly to the glass-walled conference room overlooking Front Street. He shot several bursts through the glass at lawyers, clients, and a court reporter. He walked toward the offices of partner Alan Burke. Again, opened fire, apparently shooting Burke point-blank. 
then briskly around the office, firing randomly at secretaries and lawyers, and down the interior office stairs to the 33rd floor. He continues shooting and killing there and walks down two more floors. A call goes out to 911 and police arrive within two minutes. The incident commander says this was one of the most difficult situations San Francisco police have faced. We had thousands of people in that building and we had 48 stories and we had to find and isolate one individual in that building, contain him, take care of the wounded, and try to get everybody out and evacuate him. By this time, building security officials have issued an alarm, warning people to stay in their offices. At that point, the gunman found himself trapped. Police controlled the elevators. There were SWAT teams on the floors above and below, and the stairwell exit doors were all locked. The gunman then tried to make his way down the stairway, confronted police, and then without a word, shot himself in the head. Obviously, this man had thought about what he was going to do and, and prepared himself for it. There were a great deal of ammunition in his possession. And witnesses told us the gunman also had a hit list, at least 50 names, a note scribbled to the victim's families, including the words communist and rapist. The note was just, you know, basically a list of the people that he wanted to to, uh, to kill at Pettit and Martin. And, you know, it was several pages. Police confirmed there was a note, but declined to release its contents. Sources have told the 10 o'clock news. The list included names of Pettit and Martin lawyers, but of the people Ferry actually shot, not one appeared on his list of intended victims. John Fowler for the 10 o'clock news. Well, there's new information in tonight on where Ferry obtained the guns he used yesterday. Two of the three are so-called assault weapons. And there was a renewed call today for an outright nationwide ban on all such weapons. As a gift with us here now with that part of our report. Leslie? Dennis, San Francisco police are now saying that all three guns used in yesterday's mass killing were purchased in Nevada, one as recently as last Friday. In the state of Nevada, assault weapons like the ones used yesterday are legal and there's no waiting period. California, however, the Intratec 9 is on the banned list, but with yesterday's rampage serving as grim evidence, it is clear the guns are easily carried across state lines. This is a weapon of war. Police officers don't use them. Citizens certainly shouldn't use them. Even hunters don't use this type of a weapon. This is only used in the military. Assault weapons were, in fact, made for war, to fire rapidly, be concealed easily, and to wound so that troops would have more injured to slow them down. I think the American people have to come to grips with the fact that this has gone on long enough and that none of us are safe as long as we allow the purveying of weapons of war on the streets of every city in this nation. Uh, Senator Metzenbaum, and I have a bill which would ban the manufacture, the sale, and the possession of exactly the weapons that this man yesterday used to kill nine people. The bill would provide a federal ban on all assault weapons, but going up against the mighty National Rifle Association and the Second Amendment can be political suicide. But California senators say this horror may provide the courage. I think it's important that we have the courage, despite the fact that there'll be lo those who would threaten us, that they're going to run against us and beat us. To me, it's even a, it's a personal tragedy because my son was very close to um, one of the people who was killed. As a matter of fact, a person who is considered a hero uh, because he actually uh, ran downstairs and, and placed himself in front of his wife, um, John Scully. Authorities say tonight, had the gunman had to reload, it would have taken him hours to do it by hand. Instead, he had hundreds of rounds of ammunition loaded into clips, clips that feed rapid fire into assault weapons. A weapon like this, which is a 9mm semi-automatic handgun, there is absolutely no reason in any kind of an urban setting to ever have a weapon legalized and be able to have it available. The laws in California against assault weapons are considered some of the most restrictive in the country. Still, law enforcement officers say assault weapons are everywhere. Some bought before the ban and some, of course, brought in from out of state. Many gun control advocates complain that as soon as an assault weapon makes the banned list, the gun manufacturers often just modify it and they call it something else. 
and then they sell it anyway. Those who oppose bans on assault weapons say that it is virtually impossible to define what those weapons are and that banning them would also ban similar weapons that should be permitted. They also fear a ban is a first step toward banning all guns and a violation of constitutional rights. One other note, apparently the guns that the killers used yesterday, the killer used yesterday, were in poor condition. Police say that they appear to have jammed and that if they had not, more people likely would be dead.